going to spend a little bit more time in Second Peter to finish okay. up again. There's a lot there. Yep. And then uh, we'll get into Zephaniah and get through some verses there. It, it, when you read Zephaniah, it's almost like a continuation of Second oh, Peter. Yeah. It's amazing. I was, when I looked at that, I said, whoa, same, same subject matter. So, yeah. yeah. Okay. So let's ask God's blessing on our time this morning. Father, thank you again for the privilege to come into your most holy presence. We come in the name of your Son and our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. We have no righteousness of our own, Lord, and we come clothed in his, and we come before you this morning, uh, a grateful people, praising you for your goodness, thanking you for your provision for our every need. And Lord, a number of our folks that are normally here are not here today. We think of Bill uh, coming, uh, you know, recovering from the, from the virus, so we pray your hand of healing on him, and then our a friend uh, Sharon, uh, having gone through a major heart surgery here in the last week, we pray your hand of healing there. Father, we ask for good results here for her uh, recovery. We look forward to seeing her back here. She's been faithful, and we thank you, Lord, for that. So many of our friends and neighbors here in the park uh, have great need, a spiritual need, Father. They need Christ. Uh, more. That's the primary thing they need. They need the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior. They're trusting in make-believe things, myths, and all other kinds of things that will do them no, no, nothing but harm in the days to come. We pray for our church family filled with uh, issues of, med of, uh, of uh, physical issues, Father. We pray for our brothers and sisters in Christ, your hand of healing there, our pastor and his wife and, and so many others. Think of Matthew. And Lord, we just thank you again for the privilege of doing this. We pray for those that might be watching or looking at the... Uh, the videos uh, later on that uh, your word would go forward with great power and boldness, not my word, but your word. I'd say nothing here this morning that would lead anybody astray from your truth and that we'd honor Christ in all we do and all we think. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. So, all right, so I just couldn't seem to be getting anything together. The, the, the time was going by this morning, it looked like it was going by quarter by quarter rather than minute by minute. <laughs> And uh, I just was out of time before I, I knew I was out of time. And uh, so let me get here to Second Peter again, and uh, then we'll touch touch base to get into Zephaniah. And uh, let me see where I wanted to start. I wanted to just point out a few things that uh, uh, we don't have all the answers to them. I, I call some people I trust. <laughs> they didn't have all the answers either. There are some things that... Uh, I don't know, maybe as we study and as we get more led by the Holy Spirit, maybe we would know. But right now, I don't know, I have all the answers. I have thoughts about it, and I'll share the thoughts about things, but I don't really have dogmatic answers. I know I'm saved, I know how I'm saved, and I know that dogmatically. I, I'm betting my, I'm not betting, I'm placing my life upon that. We don't bet. We don't bet, we don't take, Christ is not a chance. He's a sure thing if you, if you come to him. So in verse 9 of Second Peter there on page 40 in chapter 3, he talks about the Lord, the Lord not being slack in his promise. Some people call it slackness, but as long-suffering. Uh, things happen in the Lord's timing, not our timing. We, we look for, he tells us to look for his coming, and he told the, the early church 2,000 years ago the same thing because he can come at any time. And so we are to be watching for his coming. But then in verse 10, it really is not about the rapture. It's not about the catch being caught up to, to be with the Lord in the air. It's about judgment and judgment and judgment. It says, but the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night in which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise and the elements shall melt with fervent heat and the earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. So uh, we're talking about the day of the Lord. And uh, go back in, uh, I had some numbers here, maybe I'll get to them later. You know, when is that happening? When, when is the day, well, we, we think of it as a period of time rather than a particular day. And so we look at the day of the Lord as immediate, almost immediately, immediately starting after the church is taken out of here by the rapture. Then we have that 70th year of Daniel taking place. It, it's a Jewish time. It's, it's uh, the 70th week of, of God's 
judgment on the nation of Israel for their idolatry. Uh, the judgment will come upon the earth for for wickedness and for sin. It'll be a time of, in the early days, maybe not so bad. Things might seem to be going along okay. Uh, there's a new temple be, uh, built uh, in, in Jerusalem. And then the man of sin comes on the scene, the, the Antichrist. Things go seem to go well for a while, and then he tr shows his true colors and his true eating, and his true power, which is he's powered by Satan. Everything is driven towards Satan's goals here, and then we have all the all the judgments that are in the Book of Revelation mentioned: all the seals, the famines, the, the earthquakes, the, the the rains, the floods, the diseases. All of that comes, and it comes upon it comes upon everybody on the earth. You know, the Lord, I was looking at that this morning, the Lord, oftentimes things get judged or, or nations get judged or places get judged where there are believers and not believers in them. And the Lord doesn't say he'll save us from those things. He says he'll save us through those judgments and through those trials that may come. I mean, when a drought comes in, a, in, in an area, it comes on the whole area. It doesn't come, street, doesn't come street by street or house by house. It comes upon the whole area. And so the Lord gets us through those things. He goes through them with us. But this day of the Lord is talking here in verse 10 about the, in which the, the, the heavens will pass away with a great noise and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. That can't be before, it cannot be before the, uh, uh, the millennial kingdom period. I mean, everybody would die if, when that happens. So that has to be the day of the Lord at the end of the millennium. And then there's a lot of questions about, about who's left at the end of the millennium. We'll talk a little bit about that. Defi is, you know, and here I mentioned in verse 10 as one of the, the, uh, one of the references, Zephaniah in verse 10, we won't get to it. Day. That day is a day of wrath, a day of trouble, and a day of distress. Zephaniah identifies it that. And then in Revelation talks about uh, and it talks about the nations here and that was the thing that was as I spent a bunch of time on uh, the uh, the nations we talk about the nations last last week uh, in uh, the notes last week I said so if the nations include all all that were those nations then only Israel is left on earth at that time and they are all all believers and then I had some question marks I said, there is much we do not understand because God has not told us everything, but he has told us everything we need to know. So the nations, that was the question, you know, because at the end, at the end of the tribulation period, there is what is called the judgment of the nations where the, the Lord divides a group of people, sheep on one side, on the right side, goats on the other side. Now the question I had was, are these nations, or are these nations as it refers to Gentiles? Because we, the, the word nations is often used in the context to, to speak of Gentiles, the, the surrounding nations when he talks about Israel. He's talking about so the surrounding, uh, surrounding Gentile people, all of them. But there are occasions in the Bible when the, the, the word nations refers to a specific gr group of people like Mo the Moabites or the Ammonites or the Philistines or the Hittites, all, all those individual nations. So in the judgment of the nations, are, are nations being judged individually or are Gentiles being judged? And I didn't have an answer. I didn't, I, you know, I searched and I searched and I, I got opinions, but no, no sound answer. So, it, it, and it makes a, a difference to me in who goes into the millennial kingdom. We we come, uh, often think about uh, people going into the millennial kingdom. We know there's 144,000 Jews for sure. Maybe there's more, but we know for sure 12,000 out of every tribe they're going in. But there are Gentiles going in. The Gentile people is going into the millennium, and we know some things about the in the millennium that we talked about last week. And I'm just kind of going off on the notes. We know that in, in the millennial kingdom, that thousand-year period, people will have 100 years to get saved, and then they'll lose the opportunity. We know that people will live to a 
an old age. So what is that old age? We're not told. We're, in many places in the Bible, we're told how long people live, especially before the flood, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. After that, not so many. I think Abraham lived to be 180. I think Moses lived to be 140. And so I'm thinking that old age is somewhere between maybe 150 and 170 years, five years old. We don't know for sure, but I do believe that people will die of old age in the millennial kingdom. And so uh, otherwise people that are born in the beginning of the period are gonna live for 900 and some years and people that are born halfway through are gonna get five, only get 500 years because what happens at the end of that age, here we go looking for the hasting and coming of the Lord where, uh, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved and the elements shall melt, melt with fervent heat. There's nobody living, no people living in that environment. That's a destructive, that's a destructive act that's going on there. So this was some of the things that I was uh, thinking about. We, there's going to be a new heaven and a new earth. And uh, in verse 13 uh, there in 2 Peter wherein dwelleth righteousness. So there's a, a new world, uh, a new heaven and a new earth. Uh, and we don't, we don't have a lot of information about that. We have information in, uh, in Ezekiel about a, a huge temple. But not, not, every, not everybody's not going to live in the temple. The temple is a place of worship. Then we have the information about the New Jerusalem. And how, how big is the New Jerusalem? It's what, 1,500 miles. <laughs> when you count the furlongs and th things, it's 1,500 miles long, 1,500 miles wide, and 50 miles high. So is it gonna be an earth? Because if you look at the earth, <coughs> where, are the, where are the satellites right now that are going around the earth? They're not even that high. So do you have this round, bo round ball earth with this city? raising 1,500 miles out of it. It's, you know, it's, it's, it's hard to understand that in the, in the environment we live in because it doesn't, doesn't seem to make any sense that, that it would be just a city on the earth sticking out like that. You know, it, we don't have all the information, but, but as we read through here, we're reading this stuff and we're supposed to make some understanding of it and some application. There's a lot of judgment coming. <coughs> we, need, we understand that. Much of the world doesn't understand that. They're seeing some of it right now, but they don't recognize it as that. They've given it other names, like global warming and all this other stuff, which in, in their terms, it is an unusual event. Well, global warming is not an unusual event. Back in the 50s, they were worried about an ice age. You know, so that happens. But it, I believe it is God's judgment. And so we're talking a lot here about judgments. And it says here, but we're to be looking for these things. So why are we looking for these things? If they're so far in the future, according to God's word, that we're not going to be here. At least not in our current state. So there's got to be a reason for that. Wherefore, beloved, seeing you look for such things, be diligent that you may be found of him in peace and without spot. And I think last week I'm gonna uh, we uh, and uh, we we moved along and, and then we in verse 15 we talked about and and account the long suffering of our of our Lord is salvation even our beloved brother Paul according to the wisdom that he has given unto to you and verse 16 as also in his epistle speaking in them of things which are some things hard to be understood see. Uh, you pass over that. Why is it? Was it? What was hard to be understood by by Peter? Well, where was Peter's focus? His focus was on Jewish believers, right? He was the apostle to the Jews, amongst the other apostles to the Jews. So his focus and his thinking is on Jewish believers. So there were some things hard to, to understand in Paul's teaching. Well, why was that? Well, it was because God gave Paul information he didn't give the other apostles. The other apostles didn't understand the church, Jews and Gentiles mixed together. The, the, the other apostles didn't understand the, the, the catching away of the church. The rap, they didn't understand that. And, and so there was a number of things that, that, that Paul brought up that were hard for the Jewish, new Jewish believers especially 
to understand. Now, the Gentile believers, I mean, they had, you know, it, it was night and day. They went from idols in the woods and worshiping stuff on their counters and things planted in their backyard to worshiping the true, worshiping the true and living God. So they didn't have to under, uh, overcome a huge re religious commitment like the Jews did. In 1,500 years, they were committed to the law. And so uh, that's what he's talking about. But, you know, he, what he says, he calls them scripture. How in, that is so important. And I think we had a, a lesson on Sunday night at our church about how important it is to understand that this book is God's word to us. It is, it is, it is reliable. It is accurate. And we can and should believe it just as he is, as it is. And then for, we got... Towards the end there, it says in verse 17, Ye therefore, beloved, seeing ye you know these things before, beware lest ye also be led away with the air of the wicked, fall from your own steadfastment. There's a lot, there's a lot of ungodly teaching going on. It's so easy for people who are not grounded in this word to be led astray. And uh, very easily led astray. And so he's, he's pointing that out. And tells them to grow in grace. And then I had one more thing I wanted to mention before we got into uh, put it on a sticky. <laughs> is because my understanding of, of the millennial kingdom, we, we understand it's going to, you know, we know people from this, this, this age or this time that we're living in are going, to, are going to live into that. It's not like they're not going to walk through some stargate with flashing lights and stuff like that. I mean, you go from... Uh, it, it's just going to be a, a new, new, a new leader. The Lord is going to be uh, ruling in, in righteousness. And there's also scripture that says that David's going to be sitting on that throne. And we don't quite understand all that that means either. Was it would it be the spirit of the Lord uh, ruling, or whether it be da David? It says David's going to be ruling. But in Isaiah, we talk about, but it's going to be a wonderful world. But there's still going to be sinful believers in there with with uh, t uh, with tarnished uh, natures. So is it is is it the whole world that's going to be uh, changed, or is it just a specific group? I think it's only. I think I mentioned last week, talking about the wolf sitting down with the lamb and the bear and the ox eating together the things. I don't believe that's going to be worldwide. I don't understand how how you create a Garden of Eden type environment with a world full of sinners. Remember, Adam and Eve were put out into the cursed world, and the, and the ground. And as far as I understand, the ground is still cursed in the millennium, and the curse is still enforced because how? Because people were dying. If there was no curse, people would not die. So we got to understand that the curse, is still, the curse of uh, at the Garden of Eden, and the, is still a curse. In Isaiah chapter eleven, verse nine, it says, "It's talking about the the animals, and it's talking about the eating, and it says, they shall not hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain, not in all the earth, but in all my holy mountain." And we know from other scripture that during this age there was a great tendency and a great desire for the Gentile people to get hold of Jewish people in the sense to take hold of them. I don't think maybe physically take hold of them, but, but get together with them to go up to Jerusalem with the Jews because I believe the environment outside of, of that area was different than it was, than, than it was there in Jerusalem. So, so many questions about that and yet we are supposed to be looking for that age we're supposed to be teaching about that age but there and, and sometimes when I look into it I come back away with many more questions than I do with answers so I just want to pass along you know my thinking uh, on, on those things and uh, I hope I don't do any harm to, to, to your beliefs but there's just some things that just hard for us to to put in perspective right now we can see God's judgment on this earth right now. I mean, we can see it. The rest of the world can't. I mean, there's droughts everywhere, droughts in Italy, droughts in Spain, droughts in France. People can't get uh, drinking water out of their tap in, in some of those countries anymore. 
Rivers are drying up, lakes are drying up, wildfires are out of control. And we got all these political cra craziness going on besides. And you know, God, God's just withdrawing. He's the strong delusion is starting to set in. These people believe they're doing the right thing. You know, it's nonsense, but they think it's the right thing. Anyway, Zephaniah chapter 1, verse 1. The word of the Lord came unto Zephaniah, the son of Cushi, the son of Gedaliah, the son of Amariah, the son of Hizkiah, in the days of Josiah, the son of Ammon, king of Judah. Uh, the word of the Lord. That's God's inerrant word. When God speaks, it's inerrant. <laughs> Uh, this this phrase, the, the word of the Lord, occurs 242 times in the Old, the, the old Testament. <laughs> so God spoke a lot in the Old Testament. He had a lot to say. And he had to repeat a lot because they were dull of hearing, as we are. It is in the Psalms that the character of the word is described. That's where we get the character of God's word. Psalm 18, verse 30, as for God, his way is perfect. The word of the Lord is tried, it's pure. He is a buckler to all those that trust in him. Psalm 12, verse 6, the words of the Lord are pure words, as silver tried in the furnace of earth, purified seven times. Seven is the, is the number of completion. And so it's pure. There's no, it's not 99 and 44, 100% pure like ivory. It's 100% pure. We don't have many things on earth, if anything, that is 100 for sure, except God's inerrant word. So here we see in Psalm 33, verse 4, for the word of the Lord is right, and all his works are done in truth. Psalm 33, verse 6, by the word of the Lord were the heavens made, and all the host of them by the breath of his mouth. There's great power in God's word. He spoke the worlds into existence. He didn't have a kit delivered by Amazon or you know his, you know he, he, his word so we see the purity we see the righteousness and we see the infinite power of God's word in, in those verses and it was given to Zephaniah who is this Zephaniah there's no and there's no substitute there's no alternative for God's word so it came to this man uh, Zephaniah the son of Cushi and they have all these things so we are so why, why did he give us all those names? Well, that's how they told time in Old Testament time. Remember, we go to the New Testament, we talk about the birth of the Lord, it's, and it's all about who was on reign here, and who was, the, who was the king there, and who was the governor here, and who was the governor there. And if you draw, take a sheet of paper and you draw out the lines, and you put a timeline down here, and you have this king here, and this king here, and this governor here, and this governor there, and this governor here, and this thing here. And then you draw a line down through it, and you find the place where all those things happened at the same time. you got a point in time. You've got a day. You don't have a calendar like we have, but you got a day. And so that's why we get all this information here on this man. This is to determine a specific man by the name of uh, of. Zephaniah, and we needed four names. We needed Cushi, then we needed his father, we needed Gedaliah, then we needed his father, Amariah, and then we needed his father, Hezekiah. So when we have all four of those pieces of information, we know that we have the right Zephaniah. And so he's a prophet. Uh, we are given his, uh, and we're given his specific biological information of his forefathers, and that's how we know how he is. We don't know anything else about him. That's all we know, and we know that he's a prophet. We don't know how long he prophesied. Uh, I believe he was a prophet uh, in the time of Jeremiah. Uh, the northern tribes were already gone, and so he he's uh, he's in the days of Josiah the son of Ammon the king of Judah he was one of the later later kings of Judah so this takes care of the timing of the of the prophet's ministry uh, prophet's ministry so we now know when not according to our calendar but according to the, the identification of here when this man was was doing his prophecy work we don't know much about him at this point, concerning his age, or his, I don't know what occupation he might have had, or any family, he might. We don't know any of those things about him, but we know he's God's prophet. 
We are not told how this prophecy from the Lord came to him or where he was when he received the Lord. He might have been asleep. He might have been out in the fields. He might have been in the, on the mountainside with sheep. He might have been in a carpenter shop. He might have been a, a vision or, or something. We don't know. It just says it came, came to him. And so we start off right off with the prophecy itself. We don't get any information, more information here about the man. And he says, I will utterly consume all things from off the land, saith the Lord. Right, right then and there, we are picking right up from, from Second Peter. It's judgment time. I didn't pick it that way. I just, that's the, the Lord laid Zephaniah on my heart. And, and so it, it is judgment again. I will, not I can, or I may, or I should. He says, but I will. You know, God says, he says, I will. I don't know if you've ever said, I, and God said, I may or I can't. He never says that. It's always, I will or I will not. And we can't say that because we, we, we give effort to things and sometimes the effort doesn't pay, pay off. It doesn't work. And God puts effort into something that always works. So when we say such things like, I will, they are presumptuous. <laughs> Sometimes we, we, we do things in the past and then someday we say, I'm going to do this same thing. And we find out all of a sudden we can't do it because we're presumptuous. And so when God says it, it's, it's a certain thing. He says, when I will, he means, he means it's going to happen. He says, utterly consume. That's terminate and perish all things from off the land, saith the Lord. This is a widespread, utter, you know, ut utterly kind of thing, declaration of judgment from the Lord to come upon things that are on the land, its occupants. He says, I will consume man and beast. I will consume the fowls of the heaven and the fishes of the sea and the stumbling blocks with the wicked. And I will cut off man from off the land, saith the Lord. So he says, I will consume man and beast. And he says it twice. I will consume, I will consume. So I think in the, in, in the first occurrence of that phrase, I think there's no distinction here. It's just a general, just a general statement. But in the context, it, it, you know, it's, it's, it, it has no distinction. But there are going to be distinctions to follow. So then he says, I will consume. And the word is an, kind of means to annihilate. He says, I will consume the fowls of the heaven. I will consume the fishes of the sea. He says, and I will consume the stumbling blocks, perhaps a reference to idols, you know, we, we, something like that. Whatever it is, he says, I will consume them. He says, I'm going to annihilate them. And then he says, I will cut off man from the land. The Hebrew word for cut off is different from the one for consume. So why is God making the distinction here? He's using a different word. When a man dies, he or she leaves the, the earthly body and, and, and we go, our soul goes to a different place. That is because the souls of animals are not eternal. But the soul of man is. We are made in the image of God. We have an eternal soul. Animals do not have an eternal soul. And so this is such an important doctrinal truth. And it's, it's here. It's, I mean, you can just pass right over it. Why did he change words? Why didn't he say, and I will consume man from off? He didn't say, I'm going to consume man from off the earth. He says, I will cut off. It's a different word. It's a different word. He's not going to, he's not going to do that. When I die, my body dies, I go, I go to be with the Lord. Animals don't do that. And that's, but that's such an important concept. Well, we just pass over. No, you've got to think about it a little bit because it affects a lot of other things. That's because the souls of animals are not eternal, but the soul of man is. Such an important doctrinal truth. It makes incarnation a myth. It's a myth. It can't happen. Religions that purport incarnation have no blessed hope. They have no hope at all. They have no prophecy. 
They, they, have, they don't tell you anything. They, don't, they have no assurance of what's going to happen in the future. It makes, and so there, there is nothing to look forward to in those religions, nothing. There are no prophecies in the, these religions because there's nothing to look forward to except uncertainty. They have no idea. They talk about karma. <laughs> they talk about karma. What is that? Well, it's some kind of record of good stuff and you know bad stuff. You got good karma. You know, it's a bunch of nonsense. And they have nothing to look forward to. I know where I'm going when my body dies, and I hope you do. Too. I know where I'm going. I'm going to go be with the Lord. And so, you see how important that that is? I mean, it debunks everything uh, with regard to these, uh, all these religions that have incarnation, and Buddhism, and, and Hinduism, and all that. I'm going to come, maybe come back as a worm, or maybe come back, uh, you know, and, and nobody's ever come back the way they're supposed to come back. It's all myth, and yet there's millions and millions of people that believe in that stuff. Say it the Lord here. He says uh, he's going to he's going to do all these things. Say it the Lord. Uh, Zephaniah makes it very clear whose word this is. You change the name here with anyone other than the Lord, and there can be doubt. There can be doubt as to whether anything will actually happen. But when the Lord says it, does say it the Lord, it's going to happen. But when He says, and it's as good as done. The attack on the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, today is designed to create doubt as to the validity of what he said he will do and what and what we will be. That's the whole idea of the attack on him by so many people. Well, he was a good man. He couldn't have been a good man. He said things that if, that if he wasn't God were not true. That makes him a liar, a delusional. He cannot be anybody but who he says he is or else he's, he's, he's nothing. In fact, he's evil because he's lied and deceived us. So he can't be a good man like some religions say he is, but, but he's not God. If he's not God, then he's a liar because he said he was. So they create doubt in your mind. They come up with things that they say that show that he was this or that, or he was married, or he, you know, or this, he was just born to somebody. They, may, they create doubt. I hope nobody here has any doubt as to, as to his deity. And so uh, all of these things kind of fit together. You just change a little bit. You create doubt in people's minds. And so he says on verse 4, I will stretch out mine hand upon Judah and upon all the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and I will cut off the revenant of Baal from this place in the name of the Chemarims, or Chemarims with the priests. So here the target of God, the Lord's judgment is uh, is really the southern two tribes of Judah and Benjamin. We just we don't talk about Benjamin much, a much smaller thing, but right there where Jerusalem is, and so and the, Judah usually incorporates uh, Benjamin into the into the ideas. The northern Teb tribes have already been conquered by the Assyrians and scattered. They seem to have learned, and and then here. Uh, the people of Judah seem to have learned nothing as to what to happen to the northern ten tribes. I mean, they lived in the same area. The tribe of Simeon, Simeon is contained wholly within the tribe of Judah. And all these tribes, Ephraim and Dan and, and, uh, and all the other tribes, they, they, they went into captivity because of their idolatry. And Judah... And Benjamin had to see all that happening, and they learned nothing from it. They did the same thing. God's going to hold us, hold us accountable for what we know to be right. He's going to hold us accountable for not doing it. And so, uh, so they seem to have learned nothing. He says, upon all the inhabitants of, of Jerusalem, he says, and I will stretch out my hand upon Judah and upon all the inhabitants of Jerusalem. The people of Jerusalem considered themselves to be hot stuff you know where did you live well I lived in uh, such and such a place a part of uh, New York City you know and uh, you know where all the rich folks are and stuff like that and people sometimes think 
they're, they're higher or better because of where they come from. And so uh, I don't want to come from India. You know, they have poverty over there and they have filth and they have a caste system. But you know, they have a lot of really smart people. There's a lot of smart people in all of the all of the internet stuff and all of that stuff and all those businesses you check a little bit you'll find somebody from india or pakistan in there in a leadership role and so but these people in, in jerusalem well you know I, I live in jerusalem and i'm feeling you know and so they're kind of a center of of, of religious pride it was the center of worship in Israel, the place where the priest and the scribe ministered the law of Moses, and where the glory of the Lord manifested itself in the Holy of Holies. And yet idolatry was actively practiced there. And so he says, I will cut off the remnant of Baal from this place. The first occurrence of Baal here is, is in Numbers chapter 22, verse 41. And it came to pass on the morrow that Balak, we remember he was the king of Moab, took Balaam. He was that uh, prophet of the Lord. Good grief. And, and he brought him up to the high places of Baal that, that thence he might see the uttermost part of the people. Baal is a fertility god. We got our, we have a focus in this country, in this world, on fertility right now. We got pills for everything, fertility-wise. I mean, it's on all the time. It's uh, stuff that should be kind of private, and you're supposed to have some modesty. It's all gone. It's all gone. You get it in the mail. You get it in the mail. You I get. Can't believe what you, I get sometimes. I don't even open it. I throw it away. It, it, it's it's garbage. And, uh, you know, and so uh, Baal is the fertility god of, of the Canaanites and the Phoenicians, and I believe that worship of gods like Baal had great lust appeal. You know, it, there, was a, there was a great amount of, of, of sexual freedom in, in, in those religions. And uh, the saying, you know, if it does, if, if it feels good, do it. It was a saying back in the 60s and 70s and things like that. People believed that. And, uh, you know, and so th that was the religion. And it, it appealed to the lust of the flesh. And uh, having a good, we're focused on having a good time. We have the cruises and we have the parks and we have the rides and we have the the, the the bars and the dancing and the stuff that goes on all night long and the streets, the parties, the, the rockets, the f I mean, it's all about playtime. And the same thing was here. I think a lot had to do with it. And the name of these uh, Camerons with the priest, uh, these were... My understanding is, from what I read, these were idolatrous priests who were probably mingled in with the true priest of the Lord. Uh, these, these are people who today would encourage in some subtle way to accept the world's worship into the church, appealing to the lust of the fresh. They're not true to the Lord. They might say a lot of right things, but they, they subtly add in some of the world's, the world's uh, lustful desires, especially the music. Oh, it's the music. It always seems to be the music as, as the entrance point in. It's like the uh, gateway drug marijuana leads to, they don't use that term anymore. Uh, years ago, they, people realized marijuana was a gateway drug to, to other stuff. Well, so is music, is the, gate, is the uh, popular music is the gateway drug to spiritual uh, uh, idolatry and uh, Verse 5, and them that worship the host of heaven upon the housetops, and them that worship and, and swear by the Lord, and that swear by Malcolm. So you got a picture here. You got people going to church on Sunday and going to some kind of ungodly thing on Monday, and then going, you know, you've got people, and, and you got, they're worshiping two, in two different areas. He says, they worship the host of heaven. Now, let's go back a long time. The host of heaven would include the sun, the moon, the planets, the stars, and actually the constellations that are up there. And I purchased a few telescopes in the past with the design to get to know the heavenly occupants better, but I didn't intend to worship them. I just wanted to see them better. 
In my days in the Navy, I even I even been to the, the Naval Observatory in Washington, D.C., and I got a beautiful view of the heavens there. And uh, I stood at the end of the, got inside, and they, they, the inside moves around. <laughs> Telescope stays serving, they move around, and they, they let you come in and look up, and it was, I saw the moon. I mean, it was, it was, it was interesting to see it. In my days in the Navy, being at sea provided a particularly beautiful view of the heavens because there was no surrounding ambient light. All you had was the heavenly light. All the lights on the ship were, were pretty much off except a couple of running lights which were sh shielded. It was beautiful. I mean, you get out there and you just, I mean, it was incredible. And so uh, they're beautiful. And I enjoy those views to this day and, and thank the Lord for them. Thank him for the clouds. We, Marge and I, see the cloud formations all the time. And we saw like people and donuts, <laughs> dogs, puppies, people. You know, you see all those beautiful things that the Lord puts out there for us. And uh, I never did worship them. I enjoy those views uh, to this day. Thank the Lord for them. But I never worshiped them. I never had a conversation with them. There are drug programs that we are intimately related, uh, not related to, but understand. They talk about higher powers, and it doesn't make any difference what your higher power is. It could be another person, another. it could be a tree, it could be a st something out in the heavens, it could, you know, and you, you went you talked with your higher power. Nonsense. But millions of people do, do just that. So, so there, and so... And uh, yeah, where did I get? So these priests, uh, well, let me say, to worship is, to, you know, okay, to, so I never worshiped them. I never had a conversation. To worship is to prostrate oneself before them, to, to reverence them, to make obeisance to them, to be humbled before them. Well, you know, you look at the heavens and you see how great they are. I mean, they are beyond our understanding, even though we send rockets up and stuff. You know, the pictures you see on the TV are not, they don't come back as pictures. That stuff all comes back as, as digital data. And they when it gets here, they create what they think it looks like from the digital data. God will have them in confusion. It doesn't look, it probably doesn't look anything like what they think it looks like. But really, hundreds of millions of people today do that. They follow what man. They follow what man says. Their gods say. Well, there, you know, there has to be somebody to talk for the gods, right? Because the gods are, are wood, and and they and they they don't speak. Well, you know, the, the stars do speak in a way. that God tells them they speak, but they don't speak audibly. They don't tell me what to do on a day to day. They're up there. They're consistent. They have a purpose. That for times and seasons, they're up there. You navigate by. You used to navigate by. At sea, by them, you'd see the stars. You could depend on them being in the same places all the time. And so you could accurately navigate the world with them. God put them. So in that way, they speak to us. But they don't talk back to us. They don't tell me what to do today or what to wear. But if, if you're an idolater, somebody's telling you some of that stuff. They did worship on the housetops. Houses in those days had... Uh, had f accessible flat roofs with a parapet wall to keep people from falling off the roof. You know, so we have flat roofs around here. We don't have any parapet on, so you got to be a little careful about how close to the end you get. But uh, so the people would go up. Remember, Peter was up there waiting for lunch to be served when the, the sheet came down from heaven with all the animals on it. He was up on the rooftop. And, uh, and uh, walking around, people would go up there at night, you know, maybe to cool off. When you live in a desert environment, which we did in Colorado, even though it was high, in the day, in, in the day, the sun was very, very intense. You got a you got you got a sunburn in Colorado Springs a lot quicker than you even get it down here, because you're that much closer. But at night, it cooled. It was desert. It, it cooled down into the 60s and sometimes the, the 50s. So you didn't have to have air conditioning in many places. We had one air conditioner in our house, and that was in the upstairs bedroom. I had none down and none the other. You didn't need one. And so in those days, they would go up on the roof and, you know, they get up and they could see that be those beautiful heavens because you didn't have street lights and all the stuff we have today. But they, they went beyond that. 
And so in Jeremiah chapter 19, verse 13, and the houses of Jerusalem, the houses of the kings of Judah, shall be defiled as the place of Tophet because of all the houses upon whose roofs they have burned incense unto the, all the host of heaven and have poured out drink offerings unto other gods. They understood, the people understood how, how magnificent these heavenly bodies were and how consistent they were, they, how they showed up. And they did move from time to time at positions in the heaven, depending on where you were. But then they, they worshipped them and they prayed to them and they, and they spoke to them. And they, and they poured out drink offerings and they lit candles to them and they burnt incense to them. You know, we have religions that do that. But Roman Catholicism does it. Buddhism does it. Hinduism does it. Candles and incense and, and mantras. And, and you got the little fat Buddha sitting there in front of you. Oh, my. And, they, and them that worship and swear by the Lord and swear by Malcolm. I can't... You can't have you can't you, you can't have two gods. Remember? Yeah, maybe I have it in here somewhere. Yeah, I do. Malcolm is a reference to a king. It is Hebrew word Melech, and we're familiar. Uh, 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 that word Melech uh, occurs as a suffix to a lot of names in the Old Testament. They're trying to worship the Lord and the King. Exodus thirty-four fourteen: For thou shalt worship no other god, for the Lord whose name is jealous is a jealous God. He's not going to put up with it. They were trying to serve two gods at, and at the same time. Their attempts to serve the true God were a waste of time If that, when they were doing that. If he cannot have all our worship, he doesn't want any of it. He's not going to accept, he's not going to accept a partial basket of, of worship. He's not going to accept it. He wants it all or he won't take any of it. First Kings 18, 21, a familiar passage, and Eliah came unto all the people and said, How long halt ye between two opinions? If the Lord be God, follow him, but if Baal, then follow him. Remember the prophets of Baal, the days of, uh, of Ahab and Jezebel, she had all these she, Baal worship coming from Phoenicia. Her father was a, a Baal priest, so she introduced Baal worship uh, Baal worship, you know, it had a lot of lustful applications to it. So the people decided they would worship the Lord and they'd worship Baal. And the Lord was having nothing of it. And he sent his prophet Elijah and said, you got, you're going to have to make a decision here today, one way or the other. So, let, you know, let's, let's see who's going to win. They had Baal and his, the prophets do their thing and nothing happened. And, and Elijah called upon the Lord to do uh, and he you know, the fire came down and everything got burned up and, and you know the story there but that goes on today in nominal Christian churches and fundamental Baptist churches it goes on today we worship other things we may not bow down our knees and stuff but we put things before the Lord and when it comes to a decision whether to do this for the Lord or do this because it's pleasant or it's a once in a life an opportunity or a once in a year opportunity we choose that we need to choose the Lord it's always a better choice always and so and we serve we serve ourselves self-serving we're told to love ourselves to take pictures of ourselves so we love ourselves and we have people in churches that, that are that buy into that stuff Verse 6, and them that are turned back from the Lord and those that have not sought the Lord nor inquired of him. So this is all about judgment. You know, we're, it's all about judgment. And so we need, well, are we going to be judged? Well, you know, the Lord, the Lord corrects us and he admonishes us. And he's not going to let us get away with things that, you know, that are evil. He's not going to do that. We talked about last week or the week before. And sometimes he, take, he takes people right off the earth, takes them home before he'll let them go any farther into sin. And so sometimes we witness. I mean, we're, we're witnessing the same heat here. We're witnessing the same fuel costs, the same food costs as, as unsafe people, you know. But we should be dealing with it in a much different way than they are. Some people are coming unglued about it. 
The Lord says uh, he always provides clothing and food and shelter for us. So if we have tornadoes and hurricanes come through and wipe the place off the map, somehow the Lord will provide food and shelter and clothing for us. He may do it the way he did in feeding Elijah at the brook with a raven or an eagle or a, drop it in, drop down a pair of jeans and a, something, you know, and a t-shirt or something. Who knows? But he'll provide. He always will provide. So anyway, we got them that turn back from the Lord. This describes those who have totally abandoned the God of Israel. They just won't turn. We did that. We've done that in our country. We've torn it off the walls, taken it out of the schools, forbid it to be read in our organizations. We've, we've, done it. we've totally turned our back on them. We'll have nothing to do with them anymore. We won't even call our churches churches. We'll give them some other kind of name. House of the Holy Blessing or something. <laughs> yeah, you know, well, you know, they do that because they, they don't want to identify with the God of this book. Jeremiah 2.13, For my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters. That's the Holy Spirit. And have hewed out themselves, hewed themselves out cisterns. That's made themselves broken cisterns that can hold no waters. That's like having a bucket with a hole in the bottom. You ever, you ever, I don't want to do that. I can do that whole thing. I got a hole in the bucket, dear Eliza, dear Eliza. You know, and it goes on and on. <laughs> well, they have a hole in the bucket. And it's so... Uh, Broken cisterns, can we, you know, and they depended on cisterns in those areas for water. We used to have a big old uh, keg out in our farmhouse back in Pennsylvania, and we had a farm there for a while, and that, my grandmother did one. Outside, uh, they, they caught the rainwater in this big old round thing. That's, that's what a cistern does, it catches, it catches rainwater. Well, we have done the same thing in this country. It seems like everything we touch now as a country either totally breaks or at best leaks till it's empty. I mean, everything we've done here in our nation with regard to economics, morality and everything, it's either, it either completely broke it or, or, or it leaks. It, it's not working. And like, like the alcoholic that keeps trying to do the same thing over again, expecting different results, we keep doing the same thing over and we're going to, we're going to, solve inflation by spending almost a trillion dollars. Who came up with that? Satan came up with that. So, uh, and, th and those that have not sought the Lord nor inquired of him. Well, this is a different group of people. This is Matthew eleven twenty eight tells us, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart. And you shall find rest unto your soul, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. The Lord is inviting everybody to come and receive him. Come, everyone. And there's people that just don't want anything to do with them. The world does not think the Lord is relevant anymore. But they will when they stand before him at judgment. He's going to be the judge. And what are they going to say? They, they're going to be told to shut up. How do I know that? Because the Bible tells us, Hebrews 9.27, as it is appointed unto men and women once to die, but after this the judgment. See, that, that can't be incarnation if you're going to die once. You can't, you can't keep coming back and dying and keep coming back. Totally out of sync with this book. And yet we practice yoga in our churches. That's Hindu religion. That's Buddhism. It has no business in the church. You want to exercise, go to YMCA, YWCA, fitness center, not in the church. Verse 7, and I think we'll finish with this. Hold thy peace at the presence of the Lord, for the day of the Lord is at hand. For the Lord had prepared a sacrifice. He had bid his guests. And so, okay, so hold your peace. And... Uh, I think that's kind of, in the vernacular, kind of shut up, or you know, or you know, stop talking. But Ecclesiastes five one tells us, "Keep thy foot when thou goest into the house of God." This is good. This is good counsel, and be more ready to hear, and to give a sacrifice of fools. 
but they consider not that they do evil. Be not rash with thy mouth, and let not thy heart be hasty to utter anything before God. For God is in heaven, and thou upon the earth. Therefore let thy words be few, for a dream cometh through the multitude of business, and a fool's voice is known by the multitude of words. So uh, the time to get right with the Lord is before someone stands before him in judgment. It's not going to work then. It's too late. It is too late. Uh, the day of the Lord, the phrase the day of the Lord here again. Well, first of all, the time to get right with the Lord is, is before the judgment. There's no mitigation at the Lord's judgment. When you, mitigate, when you stand in a courtroom and you mitigate something, you're telling the judge or, or, or the jury or whoever is going to decide that they're giving them information that they don't have that's going to help your, help your position. Maybe not with regard to your guilty or not guiltiness, but maybe to your punishment. That's not going to work with the Lord. He already knows everything about you. He knows every thought you've had. So you're not going to be able to stand there and say, well, Lord, here's what happened on that day. You're not going to be able to do that. And I think that's the idea. Hold thy peace at the presence of the Lord. We're talking about the day of the Lord, the day of judgment. You're not, you're not, you have nothing to say. And they need, well, you know, I, you know, I want to be saved, but, you know, if I get saved, I may have to give up this or give up that. You know, maybe people think that way. Uh, For the day of the Lord is at hand. The phrase, the day of the Lord, or the day of the Lord Jesus occurs 29 times. In the, it's a time of judgment. The verse speaks to, a, and verse 14 in this, in this chapter speaks to the great day of the Lord. So, see, I'm thinking that the day of the Lord really talks about a number of different places at different times in different, in different contexts. It's a day of judgment, though. That's the day of the Lord. It's a day of judgment, no matter when it occurs. I think we're experiencing a, 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 a kind of the day of the Lord. He's withdrawing his blessing from us. That's judgment. So we can call it the day of the Lord. And so, for the Lord hath prepared a sacrifice. And then I was trying to find and understand what this would mean, because when we think of a sacrifice, we think of, what the, first of all, what the Lord did for us on the cross of Calvary. And then it, during the t days of the law, we think of the, the, the lamb and the, and the goat that were sacrificed, the blood poured out. So, but it's not that. He said the day the Lord's going to do, the, he's already, the Lord's sacrifice was the Lord Jesus Christ. But I don't think that's the idea here. Because we're talking about judgment. And so the invasion of the, I think the idea here is the invasion of the Chaldeans. Because that was, that's the judgment that was coming upon Judah at this point in time. Remember they came three times. They came in 606 BC. They came in 597 BC. And then finally in 586 BC they came. Uh, three times they came uh, to uh, Judah and, and, and Jerusalem. And to reconquer and reconquer that particular group of people and, and clean them out. So the general public has no idea. Okay, let's see. We are being in, okay. We are being invaded at our southern border, by the way, and not with not with guns and weapons, but we are being in, in, invaded with with bad with the bad religion and bad culture. Uh, the. the the general public has no idea of the, of the negative impact on our culture and society for what's going on. I mean, most of these people are either coming aboard are either Roman Catholic or they, and, and Spiritism, because from South America, you've got Spiritism mixed in with Catholicism. So you got Voodoo and you got Catholicism, you've got it all mixed in. you got all that, millions of the coming, coming this direction going to be in the government, going to be in charge of things. And then you've got people from the Middle East coming in too by the, by the thousands, coming in as pretending to be, you know, coming in as uh, immigrants. They're not coming for that. And so we're being invaded. And, and you know, we haven't seen all the, the outcome of that. The key word here, in my, in my opinion, is understanding what is going on today in our country is, is a delusion. Our leaders, the leadership in this country is being deluded. Uh, 
people, people, people are doing some of the things they're doing, the ridiculous things they're doing because they believe they're doing the right thing. That is being, de being in delusion. And so uh, it's embracing destructive things. We have lost, God, we've lost God's blessing. The next event to watch for is our withdrawal of our support for Israel. Once we do that, I think, things, I think we're going to be doing that. Once we do that, I mean, things are going to really go downhill quickly. He says, and I will punish the princes and the king's children. Now, the princes are the leader. Are the leader. Oh, I'm going to have to stop. Uh, I'll get in trouble. Let me, it's after 11 o'clock. Let me, uh, let me, because there's more to say about that. So we'll pick that up next week. All right. Today is the, today is the 11th. Somehow I wanted it to be the 11th. Well, that's okay. All right. So let's ask uh, God's uh, blessing. Father, we thank you again for the time we've had together. Had a lot of discussion, a lot of uh, about certain things we have imperfect understanding with. But, Lord, we just pray that you'd uh, finish in our heart whatever message you had for us through these words. I pray that I've done no damage to any of your, any violence to any of your word. And Lord, we just thank you for the time we've had together, thanking you for all things in Jesus' name. Amen.